Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by Jiffy Steamer, the largest steamer manufacturer in the world. It started in 1940 right here in O'Brien County, Tennessee. Find the Jiffy Steamer dealer closest to you at jiffysteamer.com. Thank you, Emily. Welcome, everybody, to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Emily, before I introduce today's very special guest, what's something you have discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? So I am from Middle Tennessee, so I always find it interesting to learn about West Tennessee and the region around us. And we have a front desk that was salvaged from the Palace Hotel that was operating here in Union City. And people would often go to this hotel in its heyday and sit and watch the trains go by. And they would see people come off and see the different fashions that they were wearing. And that was just like one of their favorite pastimes. Today we're going to chat with Lieutenant Mark Kensia with the Salvation Army. He's had a, a really interesting life and interesting journey getting there. We're going to learn a little bit about him and about the Salvation Army. So welcome, Mark. Absolutely. Scott, thank you for having me on this podcast. I I really enjoyed just listening to you guys and learning about West Tennessee. And, and being that I live here now, um, it's always cool to learn fun facts about Discovery Park and what's going on around it. Yeah, so let's let's go all the way back to the very beginning. Um, tell us a little bit about your parents. Okay, so my parents, Albert and Marie Cancio, were both born in Haiti, um, but traveled over to America, um, the northeastern part of the United States, to live a new life, a life different from what they had known in Haiti. And so while they were living in New York, they met each other and married. And while they were there, they began to have children. Um, They had five of us up in the northeastern part of the United States. And after the fifth, I'm the fifth child, by the way, um, out of six, after the fifth child that they had, uh, my dad took a trip down to Florida and while he was in Miami, he called my mom on like a payphone or something, because this was back in the early 90s. And he called my mom and was like, it's warm in Florida. We've got to come here to live. And so um, they ended up moving the entire family from the northeastern part of the U.S. down to South Florida, where the weather was a bit more tropical um, and resembled the, the climate of Haiti. And so From there, um, they had another kid, my younger brother, Jude, um, and we just continued to live life uh, down in South Florida. And so what um, what were have you been back to Haiti at all to see, you know, where they grew up and what their lives were like? I have. Um, the last time I was there was back in 2017. Um, and my dad has a house there now where he wants us to go and live at some point um, or just even go for vacation. Um, but because of work and, and scheduling, I just haven't made it a priority. But I, I will definitely be back there um, soon. And what uh, motivated them uh, to move to New- to migrate to New York? So different opportunities. Um, both my my mom and dad started their education experience back in Haiti. Um, but with what was going on there and, you know, just the lifestyle of being in a third world country, um, they knew that the opportunities would be different in America. And so um, individually, they, they left Haiti, um, like many people do, um, moved up to New York and and continue to pursue God, which was kind of cool um, because they met in church. And so while they left Haiti, came to America, they both met in church, um, fell in love and and lived long lives together. And what uh, what were their uh, uh, jobs? What did they what did they come here to do? So they were young. They were both in their early 20s. I know my mother was in the medical field. Um, So she was working as a nurse and in the health department 
um, providing health care for people. And my dad um, had been in ministry while he was in Haiti. And so he came, um, continued to do ministry, continued um, at a seminary up in the Northeast. Um, but also in between, he was also working as a driver. So he did um, some driving for various limousine companies. And um, I think he drove a couple 18 wheelers. So not only did he do ministry, but but he was also um, into public service. And so they migrated the whole kit and caboodle. Uh, where in what part of New York were you, were you guys living? So I know my siblings were born in Nyack, New York, um, but I was born in Bridgeport, Connecticut. So oh, it was okay. just that entire uh, Northeast region um, mm-hmm. where they just kind of hung out and made it their home. It's a lot colder there than it is in Florida. 100%. 100%. I mean, so growing up in South Florida, um, I I became acclimated with the climate there. Um, and then when I moved out to West Tennessee, that was another culture shock for me um, because of the snowfall and the way that, you know, just the entire area would shut down because of the weather systems that would come in. Um, but yeah. And the, so, and so you, uh, around what age, so you're in Florida around what age did you end up in West Tennessee? So I moved to West Tennessee just after I graduated from Florida state university, um, in 2014. And so I moved out to Memphis. Um, and it was at that time where I began work with the Salvation Army. Um, I fell in love with what we do, um, especially out there. Um, there, there were some real unconventional ways to engage in people's lives um, out there in, in Memphis. Um, and so that was 2016. And then I moved to Jackson back in 2020. So in the middle of the pandemic. Oh, wow. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Now, were your parents part of the Salvation Army as well? They were. So they actually retired as majors, um, but they led the entire family to the Salvation Army. And that was our church for a long time. And so with church, we did youth character building programs. We went off to summer camp um, and we played just out in the fields. And I remember I remember being part of the youth character building program that the Salvation Army has and and learning how to change a tire. Um, I remember going to summer camp for the first time, um, being that my parents were migrants from Haiti. Um, I English was my second language. Um, primarily at home, we spoke Creole or French. Um, and so I remember going to camp and I was talking to one of my counselors while I was in the cabin. And I said, um, I forgot my dra. And he was like, you forgot your what? And I was like, I forgot my dra. It's it's and I didn't have the words to explain um, that I had forgotten my sheets at home. And so after some time, um, we were able to finally uh, well, I was able to get the words so that he understood that, you know, I needed sheets for my bed in my cabin uh, that first time at camp. So we're going to come back to your story, but to sort of put it in context a little bit uh, and with your parents being involved in the Salvation Army, for a lot of us, you know, when we when we see the logo Mm -hmm. or we uh, hear the word Salvation Army, of course, we immediately think of those folks in front of stores at Christmas time that are ringing the bells. So uh, I I know there's much more to it than that. So tell us a little bit about, you know, what uh, the Salvation Army actually does and, and why your parents got involved and, and what what is it? Yeah. So again, so when my parents came, they immediately connected with a church. Um, at that time, it was the Haitian Baptist Church. When we moved down to South Florida, they continued um, to worship at the Haitian Baptist Church, but then um, transitioned over to the Salvation Army. My dad had some experience with the Salvation Army. Um, while he was in the Caribbean. And so when we got to South Florida, we reconnected. And at that time, um, that was that was actually when I began to realize that the Salvation Army was more than a thrift store. Um, that's when I learned that the Salvation Army exists 
to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to meet human needs in his name without discrimination. And so that was to me, to me, that was very attractive. Um, and then to to go to some of the worship services that would happen on Sundays and throughout the week, um, it was it was all very good. Um, I mean, so the youth character building was great. And then I learned how to play a musical instrument, which then I was able to take from church into school and into a classroom. And so it just enriched my life from a very young age. Um, and it was something that I knew as I grew, I wanted to pursue. Um, because I mean, living in South Florida, another element of the Salvation Army is the emergency disaster service. And so being able to help survivors of natural disasters um, during times of need, for me, that was awesome, right? It was fun to be able to make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or chili to then drive through neighborhoods and distribute to those that might need it. Um, and so, um, when my parents connected us to the Salvation Army at that young age and being able to to physically be part of a movement of something that engages others and helps others, um, it was perfect for me. Well, you know, I mean, we certainly live in a time when uh, doing for others is not really on the forefront of everyone's mind. What, what do you think the role of uh, volunteerism and social services is uh, in, in our country today? So I think it's huge. I think it's huge to be able to serve others, to be able to relate with other humans in that type of way. Um, I, I think Tennessee is, I mean, with us being the volunteer state, it's something that comes naturally, right? Um, we, we get it the the need to do for others um and so with with that desire that has grown inside of me um since i was a kid and living here in west tennessee you know the, the volunteer state um to be able to do this is um it seems natural it seems right i'm curious have you seen you know obviously you moved to jackson in the worst possible time i guess or maybe the best possible time <laughs> in the middle of a of a pandemic no one's ever experienced before um do, do, are you seeing more volunteerism and people helping others or less you know it's kind of hard to say whether it's more or less because i don't really know um what was going on prior to the pandemic here in Jackson in particular. Um, but I do know that people are attracted to doing good for others. Um, and so whether it's now um, older adults that want to give back their time by teaching younger kids or um, people that want to give up their time by feeding others, um, we are seeing a lot of that. Um, and I will say during the pandemic, it was prime because one of the things that we did was we were assisting students that were struggling to learn virtually. Um, we we created space in our facility so that tutors could come alongside of them and help them to be successful. Um, and so volunteerism is something that people have been able to to plug into pretty easily um, in meaningful ways. So let's go back to you. Uh, you, you, when you decided to, where to go to college and what to major in and the road to take, um, <laughs> you know, obviously a lot of young people are ready to get as far away from their parents as they can yeah. uh, and do something completely different. You know, what, what kind of thinking was going on in your head at the time? So at that time, I just knew that I wanted to be successful. Um, and I had been accepted to the college and, um, I knew, I, I thought at that time that I wanted to make a lot of money and drive expensive cars. Yet while I was in college, um, things changed inside of me where I, I began to realize that I wanted to do good for others. And I'm not saying that that can't be done if you make a lot of money. Um, I just knew with what I had experienced with the Salvation Army that that was the avenue that I wanted to take. Um, and so I wanted to to learn as much as I can so that I can 
be as great of a benefit to others as possible. So you uh, graduated. Did you work for the Salvation Army while you were going to college or after? So while I was in college, I actually worshipped at the core um, in Tallahassee. And so even during that time, I was learning leadership skills. I was participating in the worship services. I was um, I actually went and I worked at a summer camp. Um, and and so there were there were different opportunities, yeah, to work there, but also to be a volunteer. And so for those of us that don't know uh, much about the Salvation Army, what is the infrastructure like? I know you're a lieutenant and you mentioned mm-hmm. your, you know, what, how does that all work? So the Salvation Army is a quasi-military organization. And so um, back in the early 1800s, it was 1865, General William Booth um, started the Salvation Army because there were um, people living lives of addiction and homelessness, prostitution and poverty. Um, And he wanted to create something that would bring people all together, give them an identity where they felt a sense of dignity and respect out in the community. And so um, he modeled the infrastructure after the military where, you know, there are ranks. So there is a level of respect and responsibility. Um, There are uniforms so that everybody understands that you are part of something that's greater than yourself and something that um, works to serve others. And so the rank of our organization, after being commissioned as an officer, you start off as a lieutenant. So um, I am within my first five years of officership. And after five years of, you know, of service, I then am promoted to the rank of captain. And then after 15 years of service as captain, um, I would then be promoted to be a major. Um, Everything above the rank of major um, involves a specialized appointment. So, you know, if things go well, I'd be a colonel or um, a commissioner or even the general. And there's one general whose office is out in London, England. Well, my money's on you becoming a general. Right on. <laughs> um, we're going to, um, I've got a couple of other things to chat with you about because this is so interesting to me because I've seen the logo so many times. So we're going to get some more information as soon as we get back from this really short break. Jiffy Steamer offers the world's finest clothing steamers, steaming products, and steamer accessories. They've been made in the USA since 1940 and now have more than 1,000 dealers across 55 countries. Jiffy Steamers are trusted by professionals such as Macy's, Neiman Marcus, Coach, and others. Find the Jiffy Steamer dealer closest to you at JiffySteamer.com. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or your podcast catcher of choice. Our guest today is Mark Kensia, and I'm your host, Scott Williams. So, um, Mark, I'm curious, um, when I see those folks out in front of Walmart or wherever ringing the bell and raising money during the holidays, are those volunteers or are those people that work for the Salvation Army? Yeah, so there is a combination of both. Um, we primarily use volunteers so that all the money that's raised through that fundraising campaign Um, is able to be used um, for the community in which it's raised. And then there are those that we do employ, and those are part of our workforce development initiative where people that may not work throughout the year but want to earn some money to buy Christmas gifts or um, whatever, uh, they are able to make some money. Um, But the majority are volunteers and and the majority of the money that's raised is used to stay in that community to provide, um, whether it be a social service or um, provide a disaster relief for individuals that might need it. So, you know, when I see those folks, I immediately think of how many there must be around West Tennessee. And I wonder Mm -hmm. how in the world does all that get organized? So 
talk to us a little bit more about the process that you all go go through and how many there are and where do you store all those uh all those buckets you know the rest of the year so talk to us about that yeah so we build partnerships throughout the year um and that's with different realtors who might own properties um or organizations with schools that might need volunteer hours um individuals civic clubs anybody anybody that understands the work of the salvation army um we build partnerships so that those people can volunteer to ring um, because a lot of times those those funds are used to keep people in their houses people that might be at risk of eviction um, those funds are used to provide food assistance for those that might be struggling to um to have food in their refrigerator or on their table. Um, and I know for us here in Jackson, we portioned uh, some of that money to send kids to camp. And so we have a goal of sending 50 kids to camp this summer, kids that are from this area, kids that may not otherwise get out, um, but want or need the opportunity to get out and meet new people. Um, and so, the Red Kettle campaign is is our largest fundraiser, um, and it is used to sustain the mission of the organization throughout the year. And so it is a combination of volunteers, people that are interested in the organization um, and employees, people that just need a little income um, during that holiday season. How many how many people are out there like during a typical holiday? Not enough ever. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I know here in West Tennessee or in Jackson, we have um, 26 locations. Um, and so there are at least 26 um, a day. Wow. Now, and yeah. so you're, you're Jackson. Um, what other cities have sort of a, uh, an office in West Tennessee? So the Salvation Army um, operates in every zip code across the United States. Um, and so whether it's through a physical location um, or if it's a service unit that shares space within a local church or a library or chamber of commerce. Um, so there, there, I really can't even give you the number of, of locations that we have, even in our region. A lot. Um, a lot is a good answer. 100 <laughs> percent. Um, but I do know that that we have uh, partnerships um, nationally and locally with different stores like Walmart, Sam's Club, Kroger, Food Giant, Food Lion, Walgreens um, and things like that um, so that we can raise the funds needed. So there may be some young folks out there uh, right now listening who are trying to decide what direction their life should go. Um, you know, obviously there are jobs that are more service oriented versus jobs that are, you know, also necessary that are less service oriented. You know, what do you say to, to young people who are trying to decide what, what path to take and which direction to take with their career? Yeah. Um, what do I say to young people? I, I mean, if you're a person of faith, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Um, and and submit to to whatever it is that he might have for you um and then i'd say do what you like do what you enjoy um do what you enjoy doing and so if that's serving people then find an organization through which you can serve people um if you're good at selling things then find an occupation through which you can sell things um and I do know, I do know people don't have to necessarily pick one or the other. A lot of folks that probably volunteer for you, uh, scratch that volunteerism itch by working with the Salvation Army, where maybe they're bankers or real estate agents or something completely different in the daytime. Absolutely. And, and to those types of people, we try to enlist them as advisory board members, um, to help us in making decisions that impact what we do in our community. And so, yeah, there, there is a way to do both, Scott. So the, the mission of Discovery Park is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. What inspires you? What inspires me to see beyond? Maybe potential, the potential of life, the potential 
in human beings um, and just the unknown, I'd also say, um, just staying curious, right? Not necessarily having all the answers, but um, living in a state of wonder where it's like, hmm, I wonder what could be. And then discovering what it could be and, and, and trying to embrace whatever it is as, as something to grow from, um, something beneficial. Um, and applying it to life as something learned. So uh, your parents, are they still living? One is. My dad is still alive. My mother passed away earlier this year. And your dad's yeah. still alive. Is he still involved in volunteerism? He is. Yeah, he's actually working on developing a Sunday school class um, for the Salvation Army where he is. And the Sunday school class would be primarily in uh, Haitian Creole. So he's still very much connected to his roots. He's still giving back. Um, yeah. That's great. So if someone's listening and they're thinking, you know what, I need to get involved. There's obviously lots of nonprofits out there where they love volunteers like us at Discovery Park and you guys at the Salvation Army. Um, they know how they can get a hold of me. Um, how do they investigate further to find out what kind of service opportunities are available? So if you look online, um, you can go to www.salvationarmyusa.org. And through that, you can find every location or information on what the Salvation Army is doing in any area across the United States. Um, I mean, we're also an international organization. We serve in 133 countries. Um, and so you can find information on what the Salvation Army is doing around the world and in our neighborhood um, by visiting us online. We also have a Facebook page. And so um, look us up on Facebook. I remember when I was younger, I was so curious and I just typed in the Salvation Army into Google and so many things populated. And so on every platform we could be found and, and people can connect with what it is that we're doing. Oh, that's so nice. That's excellent. Well, I appreciate you for joining us. I know you've been here to, to our events at Discovery Park, and uh, you're very involved here here with us, so we appreciate that. And I appreciate you being here on our podcast today. Absolutely. Scott, thank you so much for having me. And thanks to all you listeners who've joined us uh, today at Discovery Park. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. Oh,